and welcome to Not Another Car Vlog. This week, the Fox body truly becomes a drift car, as Jan Duncan from Duncan Motorsports flies from the West Coast to install his angle kit and a number of other components that will enable us to get maximum angle out of the Fox body. At two hours, it's the longest video we've ever made, but if you're going to undertake the same modifications to your Fox body, Jan is an invaluable resource. Jan has the tips, tricks, and knowledge to help you install these complicated components as a cohesive system that when modified will work together to give you maximum advantage. Enjoy. Right now we're just ripping off the suspension as we can and ripping off the brakes, the sway bar. So once we do all this suspension, it can freely get out of the way and we're not ripping or held up by anything else. Yeah, these are the sway bar end links that we're taking off just to release the pressure off the sway bar. And then uh, we gotta get some zip ties and tie that up. So, or actually we're gonna be moving it because we're gonna put some cool, way cool drapes on this thing. Don't ever do this because normally you would be messing the tie rod up, but we're gonna throw these tie rods away. Uh -huh. So we're just doing it quick. <laughs> and since we're not reusing the tie rod, done. Spindle's not hurt. Right now we disconnected everything uh, from the spindle and the control arm so it can uh, freely swing out of the way, but they're held up by the jack. Uh, you notice we got everything out of the way. There's no huge bang or nothing. Um, but now we're about to slowly go up and this should gently release and nothing flying through the roof. Nothing. <laughs> There we go. Have to admit, th this works this easy with lowering springs. If you had the stock springs in there, expect it to fly out no matter what. Get back, be careful. But this is a safe way. You noticed how I did it? Standing way over here. But so, not everyone have a lift, so just be careful when you do it. Well, we got the spring safely removed and now we can remove the strut. And there's no real professional way to safely hold the shaft. If this was stuff I was throwing away, I would just throw some vice skips right on the shaft. Uh, I don't want to do that. This is nice e you know, spring lowering combo. We're going to salvage for another vehicle. So I'm going to put my hand yeah. on the chrome yeah. part of the shaft here. Now, if you hold it, the whole shaft spins, but if you trigger it like brat, 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 it'll break the nut loose and it comes off fairly easy. Uh -huh. Electric guns, as good as they, sh as strong as they are, they don't give you that good impact. So we're gonna maybe fight with this a little bit. Nope, we're good. Sweet. Shocks off, now we're just gonna remove these uh, old camber plates. So I had to remove the engine brace so I can get clear access to this. Um, if you have a uh, professional, not homemade wood brace, uh, a lot of times they're tubed and it would still give you a lot of clearance to work around. Uh, but we had to remove it. It's my first time using it. A great idea, just not in the right order. So we're gonna go ahead and, and clear and finish all this stuff, modify that. We're about to show that next. And when we're done modifying this, um, then we can put the board back on and, and continue dropping the rest of this stuff. Now we've got everything cleared off. We're gonna pay some attention to these areas, try to get whatever wires out of your way to keep a little clean, clean area. Um, when you get these kits, uh, I provide templates. And then we're just gonna cut around the outside of the line here. Um, so that way, all we have to do is place the template, draw what we need to on the actual strut tower itself, and then we can just Cut it right out. We cut out all the black. You want to cut on the outside of my markings. And then you want to carefully, well, before you match this up, we're going to draw a little template over here, but you want to clean off any kind of dirt so our, our marks actually stick. Carefully line up these three holes as good as you can. And then it shows you where we're going to mark it and how much we're actually cutting out. And there you go. Now right here, you're also gonna cut to the outside of the black. No matter what tool you use, this sucker right here uh, is kind of amazing and I would recommend at least investing in this or finding someone that has one because this little wheel 
uh, whatever your cuts or sharp edges, you can go in here and clean it up and bevel it. And also on these cars, these three holes over the years or however they've been manufactured, they're not actually perfect. And I have noticed uh, putting the plates in here and you're trying to adjust them, sometimes they hang up. And it's just because there's some crud or you know, Ford didn't you know, quite make this as perfect as they should have. So anyways, I use this and just slightly, I'm not removing or enlarging this. All I'm doing is just tracing this to clean up any little slag or imperfection. And that's all you have to do. Literally just that movement. We finished everything up top for the camber caster plates and that's actually ready to assemble. Um, but before we do that, we have to do some of these cuttings. We took some pictures, but if you're familiar with this part being straight across right here, we cut straight up here until we meet this edge. We cut straight up here until we meet this edge. And then we literally, this lip, you can tell how I cut it out. So it's literally just this strip. You're gonna cut this whole strip out. One cut, two cut, three cut. So I marked two inches back from this edge. Pretty simple like this. Just like that, two inches, two inches. Whatever you got that's kind of straight that you don't mind marking on today is gonna be this chisel. And you're basically just writing that down. Now, again, you don't wanna make this sharp edge. This is really just kind of turn. So don't be so critical on these edges because the metal will tear. If you see it start to tear, calm down. <laughs> Add some heat, let the metal stretch. So now that you got that marked, what I do is come right up to this edge and we're gonna start bending that in. Oh, let me get my glasses on. It's kind of hard to see from this angle, but it is like a 90 degree. And if you look in there and you can see my pry bar, there's going to be a part where these two metals are joined. And if you can see that coming in this area and basically see what you see in the screen right here, you bent this far back far enough. You're done. Just stop. But now if you look over here, you see how it's kind of rolled over here. This is so you're not tearing the metal. You don't need to have this as critical up front, but kind of far as forward. But if you start to tear the edges, calm down. And you can kind of notice over here, I calm down. But you also see where I started to rip the metal. So I'm gonna have to come in here and weld that back up. No biggie, but we got it two inches back. And you can see that inner seam. That inner seam is all you need to point it to. Now we need to come in here and bend this over to, to do this. Now, I'm not talking about just this lip. This entire piece has to fold over. This is a lot of work right here. You're gonna use map gas, make sure there's nothing around in the upper strut tower area that's gonna burn. Look at this burnable material, bye-bye. So you gotta really take a good look at that. You gotta match this one on the other side. You got some wires, sometimes you got a coil. So take a good look up here. Now, I'm glad we're on the driver's side. Maximum Motorsports, makes a little tool that comes in here and folds this piece over. This is on every Mustang, uh, at least up to 93, I'm positive of, but we have to fold this lip over a little bit. Now, I didn't bring the tool with me, it's very handy. Maximum sells it for only a couple bucks. Uh, it goes to like a 3 8 ratchet, and you just come in here and fold these folded over areas until basically they're flat. And the reason they do that is uh, their style coilovers would actually hit this. Well, it hits our stuff too, or it has the possibility of it. So we're gonna flatten this out too. I'm just gonna use a little presser wrench. It's not as good as the tool they use, but it'll do the job that I need. Plus, when I get this folded over, I'm gonna be beating the hell out of this hammer and I'm gonna continue flattening that out with a hammer. But you will never be able to get a hammer with this thing straight. So don't try a crescent wrench you know, unless you're doing this. If you're just using a street car and not doing this, get their tool, it's a lot more precise, it's a lot more easier to get in here. This is your Thor hammer you want. As big a hander, you know, head as you can, preferably steel and short. You don't have a ton of room in here. So you're gonna have to make little swings like this. This is a great hammer. You guys can make up whatever kind of tool that you want. Experiment what you want, this is what works for us.
for the guys that are running the stock K members, I got everything out of the way. You are going to have to cut all of this off flush with the frame. And if you're curious about that, you just get a marker, you know, try to, you know, and just mark it up. Follow the frame, go all the way down. Be very careful as brake line. You might want to bend it out this way. When you cut this far, try to bend it this way. When you get past that to cut the rest of the way, but you're going to basically on that line, you're going to come all the way down. And if you look, you see this folded over section right here? You're going to cut it all the way down here. Now, when you cut this, it's going to leave like a U. It's going to kind of look like this a little bit. You're going to take a hammer and beat this in to kind of pinch it up. And there's two pieces right behind here that is welded. And there's a possibility, matter of fact, if you come over here and take a look, you can see our marks cut past their support wells. So when you do all this, you have to come back in here and weld all this back together. It's not very much, but this will split apart if you don't do this, it's very critical. Weld this part together and then weld this seam back together. You can see it's welded right now, but when you cut behind it to make clearance, it's now an open channel and this will separate, I've seen it happen. Now tools for do this, even though a plasma is pretty cool, it's kind of hard to get a plasma uh, through these little channels. And we actually found just using a sawzall, starting from this end and use your frame rail as a guide, you can just follow it along and pretty much cut all of this off. Uh, a sawzall actually works pretty good for all this. Just be careful with your brake line. That's gonna leave you completely flush. Now, people say, oh, you're cutting off all this strength. Absolutely we are. All of this strength is for a coil spring to stay apart or together with your control arm. You know, it's a massive uh, scissoring thing right here. You don't have the spring no more because this kit and most angle kits demand coilovers. There's no stress in here anymore other than the control arms and all that strength is on the inside and this little back part. This outside here is only for your coil spring. So you risk nothing by chopping this off. Luckily, we don't have to do that because we have a maximum K member. So we're gonna end up moving this. I just wanted to show you guys for the stock K members what you're gonna kinda of have to go through. Moving this sway bar, uh, these kits, my three, four, and a number of other competitors' kits don't run a sway bar. We do have some options for running a sway bar. In this kit, we don't. Uh, we teamed up with Feel, and they threw a formula together. I'm completely happy without a sway bar. Uh, some people can argue about it, whatever. Add a sway bar if you want. In this case, we're gonna remove it, but on Fox bodies and maybe some other cars, there is a little tech secret I found that used to frustrate the hell out of me. There's a bolt coming up, and on this side, there's a nut. And this nut only doesn't spin from this plastic piece. And it was uh, what the factory used. The plastic was really strong, and it was something that they could put in place, snap, and simply run the bolts up where one person or a machine, I don't really know what they did, but it was very easy to, for them to put together. Now, over the years, this plastic breaks up, it's brittle. You can literally see how it's broken around. This should have surrounded the entire side. You can actually take a look at the other side, and it's almost perfect. But if you look real close, you can already see some cracks. And the minute you start to remove the bolts from underneath, these pieces are just gonna fall apart. And you can't just put a wrench on these nuts. They're serrated on the outside to bite into this plastic. And so you're gonna have to get vice grips on them. Um, the only way to get vice grips on them is to fully remove this uh, plastic little T-bone or whatever that thing is. And this is what I use, a long chisel. So you can kind of do it from a distance kind of wide so you can really split it and uh, make sure it's fairly sharp. This isn't perfect, but it's not bad either. And a, a decent little hammer and you simply bust it up. See how bad that falls apart? We're already done. That's it, simple. Now, if you look close at these bolts or these nuts, you can tell there's a giant ridge off each one. So you can't, you can't put a socket, you can't put a wrench on it. You gotta grab some vice grips, lock them on, and then go underneath with a gun or a wrench, whatever, and release them. Voila. You take a look close, closer look. Maybe you can see it.
We don't need your stupid. So one of the other advantages of removing the sway bar, it now gives us room to take the rack and pinion and move it forward. And somebody, well, why are you gonna do that? Well, in this case, we're gonna reuse the rack and pinion and there's no really no reason for us to disconnect the lines from it. Um, it kind of makes it easier. We have a mess, whatever, line fluid. Uh, in this case, we're gonna remove the bolts. It's an 18 up here, a 15 in the back, and there's an 11 or 7 16 12 point uh, on the steering shaft that meets the rack body. Now on SN94s and newer, uh, it's a different size. I forget what it is right now, but Fox bodies, it's a 7 16 or an 11 12 point, and you need to fully remove the bolt. Don't loosen it, fully remove it. There's a little ridge, you have to remove the bolt in order for it to release. And at that point, there's only three bolts. And this piece can literally just come forward with the rat with the sway bar out of the way, and these lines will flex. You can now zip tie your rack and pinion up here out of the way. There's no reason to remove it unless you're installing a rack and pinion. And I do recommend my modified rack and pinions if you're drifting. Uh, a lot of these cars, uh, the rack and pinions, you're lucky to get five and a half inches of travel out of them. And in all the research I found, to get angle, there's knuckles, adapters, but basically to get high angle, you have to shorten the steering arm so much, uh, it starts to affect the feel of the car. Uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's just weird stuff. So I was trying to find out the easiest way to get angle without modifying the spindle. And I broke into one of these rack and pinions, seen some things, and I realized I can gain an extra half an inch out of the rack and pinion, and it's no sacrifice. There's Nothing you're losing from it. You're not damaging the rack and pinion. You're actually just modifying the inner tie rods. Uh, as long as your rack and pinion's in good shape, like you really don't have any issues. If you're running an angle kit, I do recommend the rack and pinions. It's free angle and it doesn't sacrifice anything. In our kits, we do recommend it to fully get it. I was trying to do whatever I could to get extra angle without keep on modifying the, the spindles because the more you modify a spindle, and I don't care if it's a bolt arm piece or whatever, you're gonna sacrifice something. It could be geometry in the rack and pinion, it could be feeling the steering wheel. I actually was playing around and got like over 80 degrees of angle on these things, but the steering just felt wonky. It didn't feel natural. I try to get all my angle kits in every car to feel like a stock car, so the minute you get in it, you're like, oh, this is natural. There's no, oh, I need to get used to it. I need to adapt, I need to grow. It just feels stock and you just feel right in. And part of that was the rack and pinion. In this case, he's gonna keep it. Uh, we'll worry about it later. Again, we can keep this rack. It's not that old. I don't see anything leaking out the boots. And we're just gonna replace the inner tie rods later and that'll be it. But we're gonna basically tie it up here away from the K member. And then we can literally drop out the K member and start to put in the next one. Okay, so right here, I've noticed some people having problems saying, man, I can't get my steering shaft to line up or it's not long, it's too short, uh, it's too long. Uh, in this case, it's a little bound up on there. Uh, there was a little bit of rust on this bolt. We spray some WD-40 and the shaft's kind of rusting up, but the rubber is in good shape. Um, oh, let me see that, is that in good shape? Um, so anyways, there's rubber here you need to check, inspect. Make sure your rust isn't so bad. I've literally seen these things falling apart. This just kind of looks like some heavy surface rust. It is something, uh, I, I, in cases like this, I would always recommend a maximum steering shaft. But for people complaining that, oh, it's too long or too short, this piece has a slider right up in here. And they do it in case you get in a front end, uh, front end wreck you don't pull bolt yourself with a solid steering shaft with your steering wheel in your chest. It has a collapsible shaft. This shaft collapses up in here. Uh, on this car, I think there's like one or two sleeves that collapse, uh, whatever. And just over time, it gets rusted or it's just stiff. And all you gotta do is get a pry bar up in here. There's a little bolt. If you look tied up in here, it's a bolt and a nut. It's kind of hard to get to. It's a pinch nut. If you ever lose your pinch nut, only put a pinch nut because any other nut will fall off. If you put a nylock on here, you're right next to the exhaust. The exhaust is gonna melt the nylock, your nut's gonna fall off. Hopefully your steering doesn't fall off and you die. So always use the pinch nut. The original equipment on Fords is superior to almost anything that I found, unless it's like ARP. 
but it's crazy. Hope ARP doesn't hate me. I literally broke an ARP bolt taking it out of the box one time. Uh, it was one out of a million, probably had a defect, but I've never ever had that problem with a Ford Bolt by the time it's already coming off of a Mustang. As long as it's not rusted or stripped, they have the strongest freaking hardware. I mean, it's grade pin on almost everything. Even these little bolts are like 8.6 or, I mean, that's, that's equivalent to a grade eight. And they're just superior. They're shouldered. They're, I mean, they're amazing bolts on your Ford. Please don't get rid of them for sure. some chrome thing that you found, uh, unless you got a show car and don't plan on driving your car. So if you're thinking that your shaft doesn't collapse or stretch, you need to get a pry bar in here and you simply just pry it back or forth whichever way you need it. And if it doesn't collapse, that means your thing is rusted and it's now a, a safety hazard. Because again, mentioned, you don't want to pull vault yourself. It needs to collapse. If you want to replace it maximum, or at least find another good stock one, even though with the surface thrust on this, there's a, a rubber donut right here. It doesn't seem bad. It's not cracked. It seems fairly tight. And then there's also a U-joint right here. It's not loose. There's no play. Uh, the car actually uh, is in really good shape looking it over. Uh, and yeah, I don't, I don't see any problems with it. So we're just waiting for this uh, WD-40, hopefully to get this loose. I might have to get a little hammer and break this off. But once you slip this off, it should collapse or you really, as soon as you break this loose and you know it's gonna come loose, we already have all the bolts on the, the uh, rack and pinion done. You can just simply push the rack and pinion forward and you're gonna use this pry bar, but on this side. The maximum steering shaft, but I forgot to add why. Yes, there's a bunch of other companies that make solid steering shafts where they eliminate this rubber donut thing and give you a nice, U joint here and there. There's two of them on there. Um, the reason I say that because every other company behind Maximum, they give you a huge U joint that most of the time uh, you have to almost uh, assemble yourself. And when you say assemble yourself, you're like, what do you mean? Uh, they give you a shaft, nothing's drilled. Sometimes you have to uh, center drill where your uh, stud's gonna go. And then you have to use Loctite to put the nut on and Again, this is right next to your exhaust. How do you remove Loctite? You heat it up. So how good does that sound? So me, technically, when I first came across these ridiculous things, I would weld those nuts uh, and the shaft to the main housing of the U-joint so they wouldn't fall apart. Uh, the next problem I ran in running into that is you got aftermarket headers, long tubes, big bulky polyurethane motor mounts. Those big U-joints now hit that. And you don't want anything hitting your steering. Um, and those solid shafts also aren't collapsible. So again, pole vault in the chest. Maximums have a very nice, small, not like weak small, just professionally small. You'd have to see it in your hand. You're like, wow, this thing is really nicely crafted. Never interferes with anything. It's, it's small, it's round. The other ones that I'm talking about, you got a weld, there's a stud and a nut coming off that actually, besides it's so big, it's actually a big stud swinging around and that's what hits. It's big, bulky, you don't want it. The maximums are small and then it's collapsible. It's the only shaft I found that is collapsible so it's still safe. And that collapsible actually has a sleeve over it. So uh, for a lot of people like, man, my shaft's just shut. It's because Ford didn't put a sleeve on it and it rusted shut. So Maximum sleeved it, I never had any problems with them, and in all my years that I've been doing this for 25 years now, I've never had a Maximum shaft that had a bad U-joint or any problems with them. Uh, and other ones I kind of have, not to discredit the companies, but I'm stuck with Maximum. They make the best shaft for these Mustangs, period. We're close enough. Okay, so we got everything basically prepped as you've seen. Uh, last night we went ahead and painted it all while it was all bone stripped. We pulled off a lot of extra stuff, you know, brake lines. I already have to read bendies and, you know, we, we wanted to make it look a little cleaner. So we just pulled everything off. You don't have to do that. We just wanted to. But technically we're all done painting and ready for assembly, but we still have to pull off the K member. Um, it's a little bit of heavy. 
uh, we're trying to multitask, so I didn't take off the arms or spindles. We really don't need to. I'm just trying to take it all off in one bunch to try to make this a little quicker. And we have our homemade engine brace here already connected to the engine. We have the car all the way on the ground, rested on a jack. And I basically only have one bolt on each side of the K-member, the two big long ones, the major supports, holding it in place so it didn't fall while it was on the, the rack. And now that it's on the ground and we don't have to worry about this falling anything and the engine's secured, we're now gonna pull each bolt from each side and lift the car up. And it should just stay there. Yep. You're good, keep on going. There we are. Waka, waka, waka. What do we got now? New right. K member. Yeah, we uh, basically got it lined up how we took the old one out. We prepped the new K member uh, a little bit more stable than we did the other one, but just to kind of keep it flat and trying to take better care of this K member than the last one. <laughs> and now we're gonna lower the car, basically just reverse the procedure and lower the car onto it safely. We're not having to hold it up, fight it. And uh, you know, I might have to bend over a little bit, but it should go pretty smooth. Okay. I'll watch and make sure that we uh, stay in the pocket here. We're gonna have to replace that later. All right, we're looking good. And technically, why can I not lower this anymore? We're gonna move this rack forward just a little bit, just so it doesn't squish. All right, this one's in. I've got both of mine in. Nice, I got three more to go. And I'll work on the back. Little plate, you'll, you'll find it. So you just, yeah. Yeah, just a ug and in reverse. Ug and in reverse. Ug. <laughs> Ooh, that was a lot. So we lowered it, uh, centered it on the, on the K-member and got all four bolts started. The two big ones up front, we used the air gun to zip them tight up against the frame and then backed it off a turn or two so it wasn't tight and we can still shift around the K-member, but we can be 100%, it's not gonna fall out and kill us. And now that it's mounted and all that stuff, we can now take the straps and get rid of our engine brace. We're good to go. I'll take it off. <laughs> uh, I just want to whip up these brake lines yeah. and re-secure the fuel lines. Uh, there's nothing here extruding in our way and normally I get caught up in a situation I just want to finish it when I get there and I've put the K-member and now that it's in there I just want to see the arms and all this stuff and now I have to do all this stuff. So I need to remember we yanked all this off in a pattern and I need to go back in that same pattern. So I'm going to get the fuel lines. Uh, bolted, riveted all the way back in and get them secure. And then, then we can go through and uh, manipulate our brake line, wherever it may be, uh, forward. Uh, and I'll show you the spots where to drill and how we mounted it and bent it as we go. But once we get these things secure, uh, and I can kind of forget about it, then we can go through K-member and then I can get lost just putting all the goodies on it at once. Where the brake line is positioned on this bracket, if you don't got the bracket, you get the freaking bracket. Uh, it holds all your stuff safe. Um, but this is the factory position of where it's sitting. And because everything's kind of moved forward and you know, uh, it's kind of hard for the brake line to stretch back, um, if just moving this forward in front of this uh, uh, K-member bolt, all you gotta do is get any of this in front of that bolt and it seems to like line back up. Somewhere in here there's normally a hole that you don't have to drill both holes. Oh, I think it's actually this one right here. So I only need to drill, if you look from the side, pretty much you almost try to keep the same height. So if you look at this, not much difference. You try to keep the same angle because your brake line is already bent for it. So you keep that same clock in, you come forward. My hose is now in front of that bolt and all I gotta do is drill this little hole a little easy because you got this paint. I'll just make a little mark. And now I'm gonna drill a hole right there. We used an existing hole that looks like it's gonna be perfect for us to bite our tapered uh, bolt into. 
and the shank, our locking position, so it doesn't wobble around in there, is actually lined up perfectly middle in the bolt. So it kind of gives you an idea of where we're at. And fits right in that hole. We already found out what size that was. Got that in there, and now we can just... Now, for the brake line to get in there. And basically, move some of it inside there. This would mount something like this, right? So what I'm gonna do, bring this out. What we did was take that bend out, just kind of manipulate it with our hand. If you wanna be really fancy, start with new line. I just found that we could kind of get away with this. And you do wanna tuck this kind of tight to the frame. You know, um, take this bend out, stock clamp back in the stock hole to support it, and look how close we already are. You know, we're almost there. Plumb bobs, and there is a tool uh, that I think is a little easier, better, faster than using this, but it's not something a lot of people know about. But if you look up a, a tool called a tram bar, it's something that's widely used in the body shop uh, area and do some research on it. You don't have to square the car up, nothing. You can have the car up in the lift and literally do it overhead and it makes this whole situation incredibly faster. Um, but we didn't have access to a tram bar. It's back home. We don't have one here. Um, so we went ahead with Maximum's instructions. Now, uh, my buddy's brother actually showed me something cool today that I'm not used to doing and his job used to go a lot farther. You see how I got some tape over there in the rear? We used the plumb bobs off of Maximum's uh, recommendations and we marked it on the blue tape. And then now we can get rid of the plumb bobs. We marked it. The back of the car is not gonna move. Those are stationary. Now the car looks on the lift a little tall, but I went around and measured every corner. It's squared height wise and the plumb bobs are squared with the car perfectly. Uh, now up front, when we were moving the K-member, I remember doing these things like five different times, moving all around, and the cool thing today about uh, what my buddy's brother showed me um, was you can document your first line, get a measurement from it, move it a little bit, and it'll give you a second measurement. And you can actually record where you're going and kind of make a, a quicker change. And I literally done this a bunch of times. I've always had to move it around four or five times. And today, by doing it like this, we moved it twice and we're already done. So now we're done with the square bobs or the plumb bobs and uh, Maximum has a great write up on it, but using the tape, documenting it, I don't know if that was on their website because it's been a long time since I watched it, but this is definitely an improvement. I didn't know about it and it uh, made the job a whole lot faster, but I still like a tram bar better. It just speeds it up. I kind of forgot when I installed the K-member, there was a trick, one of my buddies, a uh, really close buddy, his name's Trent Muser Motorsports, I believe. Uh, he works on like a, a lot of one, the S97s, S550s. He's super brilliant. You know, he's a really good friend of mine. And he showed me this little tech secret he learned along the way of, it's a lot of work to square in these K-members. And when you do, you're like nervous to ever remove it because you're like, God, it's a lot of trouble. And a lot of people just really don't spend the time. I really recommend, man, squaring your K-member. It's a big key pace in these cars because they come really sloppy from the factory. But what he showed me is when you're all the way done installing these things, you can either drill a hole right here, a quarter inch hole. And when you drill this hole, you can now like flip over a drill bit or find a, a quarter inch shaft or something. And you're gonna slip it in that hole. And now your K-member is like basically lined up. If you ever take your K-member back off, you can kind of fit it up in place, put that quarter inch shaft on both sides, and now it's lined up. You don't have to square it in. It's already been lined up. And it'll be the same until you crash. So if you ever need to remove it for whatever reasons, you can just line that up, tighten everything back up, and you're done. Uh, you can either drill the hole back here or whatever here. Uh, whatever meets your fancy that you feel is gonna be best for you. We, we drilled it right back here. Uh, figure you get all this suspension or whatever may be the case. It's really easy to access right here. We're going to have to make some changes to the maximum camber caster plates and hopefully here pretty soon uh, within the next couple months I can get some time and actually send one of my done uh, reverse samples back to maximum. Uh, they were really nice working with me yet again 
to uh, reassemble these in a way uh, how I want them to be with written instructions, that's how amazing they are, uh, to where you don't have to do any of these modifications. Um, as of right now, uh, we have to do it. And some of these modifications are, there is this piece that's gonna come in installed like this. And you see how easy that went in? That's because I came and cleaned out these holes a little bit. So this is how it naturally sits. You can see how this piece is now obviously obstructing our strut movement area and it will. And it's too much work if you were to actually look up and down, it actually stops. So if you were to machine this part, I mean, if you were to machine this part all the way uh, through here, you can see it, it would just fall apart in half. So what we're gonna do is we already started, you can kind of see where we took a die grinder and very carefully we're cutting off the tack welds in there. You know, we're just kind of starting. And the idea is to be able to break these tack welds loose so we can knock these bolts out. Now, as soon as we knock these bolts out, this is how it's gonna sit when we're done. Now, these welds we cut out, it's a, you know, some ragged, jagged metal that if we were to just leave that in there, it's gonna catch as we're trying to slide this underneath. So when you cut these tack welds off, knock the bolts out, get a flapper disc, something to sand this off and make this very smooth. You can see how this edge, very nice and smooth. There's no obstructions to keep it going. So you need to break these off, flip this over to where it sits like this. But when you take the bolts out, you're gonna flip them around to where basically they're like this. And you're gonna uh, take some spacers or a nut clamp that tight so the bolt is very tight against the thing. And then you're gonna go in and re-weld these bolts back to the spacer, but reversed on this side of the plate. We'll show you that when we're done, just uh, explaining it before we do it. So as we were described, we cut those uh, spot welds on the bolts. This is kind of the finished effect. You know, you don't wanna cut too deep and damage the bolts. Really, now we got a clean spot. We're gonna reuse this area that's pretty cleaned or uh, you know, ground down to just re-reld in those exact spots. But you can see these high spots. And again, this is gonna fit. This, is, this was what sat underneath the strut tower and it's nice and smooth. So now we need to get a, a, a grinder with a flapper disc, you know, basically this tool right here that he's now putting on. And this is the tool that we cut it with. The, you know, very, very quick, very easy. This is it, great, great tool. And then we changed over to this flapper disc right here. And we're gonna use this to polish off all these high sides. So when now this is underneath the strut tower, it, it can articulate and slide very easily because all this is gonna hang you up and, and give you a lot of grief when you're trying to do your alignment. We have to now use this same piece to come and clean us a new spot because all the maximum stuff is either zinc coated, powder coated, somehow it's coated, and we have to remove that coating so we have a clear surface so we can re-weld this without any issues. Put these bolts right back in. Now, I don't wanna go in here and just weld these up, because when you weld stuff, it can pull, and this would-be bolt can now be tilted. And if any of these bolts are tilted, all cattywampus, they won't go back in the holes. So what I'm gonna do is go in Maximum's little uh, parts thing, and you're gonna see some spacers. I'm gonna block these spacers up, tighten the bolt so it cinches it tight, and then now this bolt will be perfectly flat. So when I come in here and weld it back up, we have a true square straight bolt, and then everything should slide right back in exactly how Maximum set us up the first time, like this piece. All right, so we got the side uh, smoothed off. That's gonna be underneath the strut tower, rotating. And you can always tell you did a good job because maximum number is gonna be faced up. That's what you're gonna to wanna to see. You'll actually probably be able to see this number inside your strut tower as this thing is uh, mounted. And when I was like, you know, mount some spacers and tighten it so the bolts will be nice and it won't pull, all of these spacers are in the maximum kit. I just reuse them real quick to tighten them and, and keep them there. Now. Uh, are welding them for some reason, and I don't know if it was stuff moving around in there, I noticed that their welds were here. 
Not, not on this side, not on this side where something can hit it. Uh, so I'm gonna go right back how they had it and weld in the exact same position and clocking, which seems to be straight across for whatever reason. Uh, I'm hoping it's not interference reasons, but I'm gonna put it just like they did and I should be able to get away with it. I haven't had any problem keeping it like this, so I'm just sticking with it. And then as when I'm done welding it, I'm gonna go in and spray paint all this. Uh, obviously not their spacers, I'm gonna tape off these studs so I don't get any paint on the threads or their shoulders, but I wanna preserve and save this from rusting the same way they did with uh, uh, this galvanizing or whatever kind of coating that they did use. Obviously I don't have this equipment, but I got a can of spray paint, keeping it simple, and then it won't rust. Next thing we need to do is install the camber caster plates. Um, again, Maximum Motorsports has the best uh, adjustability and we were able to reconfigure them and they're the strongest stuff on the market. And there is a certain kit for the 79 to 89, 90 to 93, and 99, or 94 to 04. If you follow how they wanted to get the caster towards the rear to promote self-steer, high-speed uh, stable steering and camber for better turning in corners, they're gonna move the strut rearward and inward towards the engine. What we're trying to do is move the strut forward and outward to basically match our arm because our arm already supplies all that plus some. So we're trying to counter that so you can actually get a, a real world alignment uh, in the single digits at a, at a normal number. Um, so in this case, uh, this is a 93, 90 to 93. These are the correct camber caster plates. This started out as a passenger camber caster plate. And on that side, the single bolt is forward, the dual bolts are in the rear, and you notice there's no part number. Part numbers underneath. Maximum don't want their part numbers being seen, they want a nice beautiful thing. So what we're gonna do is take the passenger side, bring it over to the driver's side, flip it upside down to where now this part number is like this, facing up, and then we're gonna spin it around front to back. And you're gonna notice now, this is front, this is rear. If you look at the triangle, now this hole is centered forward and outward, exactly like I was mentioning. So now the end, the part number is facing up. Uh, it's a little confusing. That's what this video is for to show. We're gonna show you a finish install, but pay attention to this. This is kinda gonna tell you if you're correct or not. And when you get this together, there is a certain uh, years in the new edge, and I don't remember if it's uh, the 79 to 89 Mustangs or the 90 to 93, we're gonna find out on this one. And if it's not this one, it's the older model. There is times that this has so much adjustment, parts of these outside edges can hit this uh, shock tower frame horn. And you might have to trim a little bit off the edge. Trim just the amount that you need to clear. Don't get carried away with it. I don't want to compromise the strength of these camber caster plates. So now that I know the correct position, you understand it. Now I'm going to put on the caster adjustment. Now they got the sticker again, looking really great forward. But if you look, you can see how there's a lot of meat here and not much back here because it's an original condition uh, or it would have been like this on the other side and sitting like this, no part number, no part number, it says maximum. Again, remember, this is the passenger original side. They got this so it can come back and it doesn't interfere with these two bolts right here. Let you come forward and there's also no interference right here. Now the thing is, this is how it's gonna be now. Remember this part, forward and outward. Well, we can't really move this forward that much because you can see how it interferes. So what we do here is spin it around backwards and now you can move it all the way forward. Now sometimes, hardly ever do you move this all the way forward, hardly ever. But sometimes you might want to and you're gonna realize it gets really close to this bolt. So you might have to come trim. I showed you a template in earlier this video where you can grind a machine the beginning of this. Okay, so we are on to the camber caster plates now. Um, we already, oh, this is cool. We can actually show an update thing. So we flipped the plate, uh, welded it, painted it, so it's still kind of secure. You can see how the studs come up. It's gonna show the part number now. And right in there, 
And again, get your Dremel or rotary tool and clearance these things a little bit because this is still slightly tight, but technically it works. And that was already after I kind of clearance this. So if you don't, these do get kind of hard and could restrict your alignment if you wanted to, but it's in there. Matter of fact, it's snug. Now I can't put this on without putting this on first because it's kind of trapped in. So I'm gonna go ahead and mount this. And when I get done mounting this, um, I'll come back and then we can uh, figure out how to put the rest of this on. Now, I, I like to just put these in the middle. If you follow the instructions how everything else goes, this is gonna be your little happy spot, right in the middle. This is your camera and caster. And this is gonna be a good point to go off of, but I'm matching both sides and, and that's all I'm looking for right now at the moment. Now that we have this basically mounted in the middle, we're ready to put this on. We're actually gonna set this to the side and start setting up this part before we can put that part on. Again, there's a happy face side on the washers. I like being able to see those. It's a little pretty thing. Everything they got is pretty. Might as well keep it pretty. You got three washers down and then you got these three spacers. They go on top of the washers. Very simple. And now we are ready for our plate. And we're always gonna have this post farthest out as possible. It's, it's where we need it. Put this in that position far out I just wanted to show you that real quick because we're gonna leave this all the way out. And you can tell it comes close, but it doesn't hit. So 90 to 93, you're gonna get lucky and you don't have to touch the camber caster plates at all. This confirms it. I actually do remember uh, the Fox bodies, one of them did. So it has to be 79 to 89. So just pay attention over here. It's a very small part so you have to trim. Just trim off the last. And if you have a 90 to 93, lucky you, you don't have to. Now we're in these studs. Again, pretty side up. <laughs> We're assembled. It comes close, but does not hit. We're all the way out. We're in the middle there. We're good to go. Now we're at the point of assembling the arms to put on the car. And you might see uh, some imperfections in the paint. A uh, customer has painted it up, and this is something that I'm trying to get into where the customer can do the least amount of uh, work to install stuff. And we were trying to leave people with the choice of what ball joints they wanted to do, regardless of what our recommended thing is. But realistically, every time we leave something to someone else, they go outside the window too much and it causes problems. This guy bought our Stita ball joints, but not everyone has the greatest selection of tools. And you can see how some of the stuff got beat up as he was installing it. Everything's still good. It just barely scraped the boot, knocked some paint off. But I'm trying to work with my partner to where these arms come with the ball joints already installed. So it just comes super simple. We're working on having these things pre-powder coated. At the moment where we're at, you do have to install your own ball joints, your own himes, and your own steering stop. When you're doing this, always install some NICs. NICs, you don't need a lot. You just don't wanna worry about it molding or bonding later, and why is it frozen? It doesn't take a lot. And this stuff is like really messy. See how it's on my finger? I'm not gonna touch anything else with this finger. I'm just gonna screw this all the way in so it's out of the way. And this will keep everything lasting on a very long time. I'm gonna hurry up and get this in there. A big question about the Himes, most people ask me, how many turns, this and that? I do have a, a written up form, but you gotta read. Not everyone wants to read, they wanna see it, so that's why this video is really cool. Again, not a lot of NICs, and they're gonna be like, how many turns? These things, you screw them all the way in, and it's five turns out. And nut goes all the way on, it can't go on anymore. We're gonna turn this all the way in, and I'll show you what I mean. When this thing's done and installed, these Himes have to sit straight up like this. This is, this is how they would sit in the K-member. So I want you to screw them all the way in and count five full turns out. Now, if it's clocked like this, just estimate, oh, well, really it's like this. If, if it was like this, then you're gonna estimate it like this. But however you start counting, kind of the favor, whatever's closest up and down. So in, in this case, we got lucky. It's already up and down. So we're gonna count five turns out. One, two, Three, four, five. At that point, I hold it, I screw this in, 
You can kind of see the NICs. And I'm just going to tighten that with my fingers so it doesn't dislodge or count the turns or lose a turn or gain a turn. Uh, try to get the rest of this NICs on this freaking thing. And we literally do the exact same thing on every Heim in our kit. We make it simple. Let me clarify when I said all the Heims in this kit is all the way in, five turns out. That also goes the same for our bump steers. You can't screw it up. It's a 5 8 thread. It's only going to fit one side. Again, a little bit of anti-seize goes a long way, especially from steel going into aluminum. Nut is all the way onto the heim. And heim is all the way into the bump steer sleeve. Now we're gonna one, two, three, four, five. And again, I'm gonna hold it, tighten the nut down. I'm gonna get some really good uh, open-end wrenches that fit this really good, snug this down as tight as I can, and you should never have to move this again unless you're replacing the Heim after a lot of years of use. All of your adjustments are in this, and be careful what alignment shop you go to, because I've had guys try to align this by loosening this and turning the sleeve. That's not how it works. It is, it, that is not how it works. Screw this together. Don't ever break this loose apart again, unless you're replacing the Heim. You're gonna do all of your uh, toe adjustments, from your inner tie rod. The inner tie rod spins. That's what's supposed to spin. That's how it was from the factory. That's how we kept it. Don't play with this. Just play with this. There's gonna be a lock nut on your inner tie rod and that's gonna lock it onto this to keep that from spinning. And that's it for the Heims. One of the things with our installs that I, I get some feedback on is, oh man, the control arm Heims come loose to the K-member. And I wasn't exactly sure why, cause mine don't come loose, um, but, I did realize this is a procedure that I go through that actually takes two or three people. And so I might as well demonstrate this or, or show what we go through uh, so you guys can simulate it at home and not have to worry about this ever again. Now, we already got the correct turns. I got this on a piece of wood. I'm gonna be turning these nuts, you know, basically this way, but you see how it lifts up? So, I stuck this extension through, only ever leverage point, and I got someone's foot over here. It's kind of ghetto, but it works. Someone's foot's holding that down, so it's not gonna lift. He's gonna have a crescent wrench or whatever wrench. It, it, you're not adding any torque on there, so I really don't care what you grab this with. I mean, tighter wrench, the better. But his job is just to make sure that these things stay lined up and they don't twist as I'm turning this. And this piece, you're gonna need an inch and a sixteenth. That's the size of these. Not in a metric, it's an inch and sixteenth. And you're gonna want uh, something really strong, wide, old, something like this that ain't gonna flex, because as good as this Craftsman is, these things do tend to open up. So if you got a dedicated uh, snap-on, or at home, I have this tool brand, it's called Plum, and they are amazing for this. Uh, but I, I don't really see them any places, and I got them uh, a long time ago. I don't think they sell them anymore. But anyways, where's over here, and it had this really cool wrench. So what we're gonna do is slip that on there. He's gonna hold it with his crescent wrench. I'm gonna lean my knee or something against here just for a little bit of stability, and I know I'm sure there's a special tool for this. This is a double wrench. Uh, it might be recommended somewhere, but when it gets this big, we're just trying to get some leverage on it. You can put a pipe. Just imagine something else that you want to do if you don't have this, but this is a process. And I'm trying to get this as long as possible so I can truly crank down on this and get some freaking pressure. And if you ain't got something this long and leaning on this to really tighten these up, I'm sorry, they will come loose, but it doesn't take a lot. That's it, it won't come loose again. Now, I need to get to this one. Obviously, I'm gonna hit this. So, we turn the arm over, slip this back through. Now, I do it this way, where this can't fall out, because if you go the other way, there's a possibility this will pop out as you're working. So, it just kind of locks it in place. It's just a little thing that I do. If you can understand it, you're more than welcome to try whatever you want. This is just how I do it, and I have a pretty good uh, success rate at it. Can we center this? Yep, see, he's centering it, straight up and down on the arm. 
Get that on there pretty good. People installing the arm and they don't know the spacing or how to line up the washers or their arm is binding or people are calling me about Heim's wearing out. Not only are my product on competitors' products as well. And I'm gonna talk about that as why. And another reason why I recommend a Maximum K-Member. Their tolerances are the same every time, every day. And whatever spacers you find correct on this side are 100% guaranteed to be exact same size on the other side. So there's no trying to figure it out. Oh, I needed this, it's a little different. And the problem with the stock K-Members are, they're all over the place. You could have a quarter inch different gap from one side to the other. And I noticed in some of my competitors' products, they don't give you shims. And people say, well, you've got all these washers and stuff like this. It's to make up for the differences in the stock K-Member. And the competitor hasn't thought about that. They just give you these machine spacers for whatever K-Member that they thought was the same as every other K-Member made. And now what they're doing, they get it in there, they're fighting it. I had customers call me, man, this guy, I don't know why they don't call the people they bought the kit from. I supply information for my own kits. And I do help a little bit helping people get through the other kits just so they can get in drive. I mean, I'm not hating, but I'm trying to show the differences of why our stuff works and why people can drive on our stuff for years with zero faults. Because this is stuff we thought about and had to deal with, and we've dealt with this about eight years ago. The stock K-members differences are so far off, and when they make pre-made spacers where there's no adjustments, you can have a gap over here, and you're tightening it up here. It can either pull the arm this way, or it can pull the arm this way, which could make the gap over here even worse, or, you know, either way. And what you're doing is creating a lot of force and load in or out on these heim joints. And they're not made for side to side play like that. They're made to be pulled or pushed. Let's get it hand tight and snug. You're gonna wanna pick up the arm and drop. If the arm can swing down by itself, when this is hand tight, I'm gonna say it's safe to move on to tighten it up. You should be able to have this torqued. Pick up the arm and drop it. If it doesn't drop, you have a lot of side load in your hinds and your hinds are gonna wear out prematurely. I already went and found out all the washers I need so we don't have to hunt. This does take a little second. Sorry for the inconvenience, but that's why we do it. There is no exact spacing. Now, we could make you exact washers like the comp competition makes because that would work for Maximum Motorsports. But we also don't want to limit our customer to saying this is how it should be done. We give you what's called like a default setup. This kit is fully adjustable. We just really don't advertise that much because we don't want the customer to get lost. Oh, I wanna do this, I wanna do this. Wherever you move this, you have to move the rack and pinion. It has to match. There's coordinates in this that we already thought out and we don't wanna confuse the customer, but if you're smart enough to understand why and what we do this, then go ahead and have fun. But if you get lost and you need to be like, man, it was better the way I got it, then go back to our system and you know, adjust from there. And if you get lost, you can come back to our default system. I love it, it's pre-planned, but you do have the ability to move the arm all the way back. Now, some people want their wheel in the center well. You can move our stuff all the way back. We just we want you to get the best out of your car, the best bang for the buck, and the ultimate most performance you can get out of your car. And like mentioned before, moving the wheelbase forward is exactly that. There's no other way around it. Uh, weight ratio, counter balancing, this is a, a huge advantage. So in this kit, you're gonna get six of these bolts. You're gonna have a really long one, a, a medium one, and a shorter one that's not shown. The most shorter one is the one that goes into the spindle. That's gonna be your bump steer bolt. You can see the length differences. The shortest one goes in your spindle, and this is how it goes in. Do not reverse this. This has a shoulder. This is very machined very correctly. You can see it doesn't wobble. Now, if you were to turn this bolt around and put it on these threads, it's actually a smaller taper, and you have all these little grooves. And if this isn't like perfectly in there, well, for example, if you install it like this, you can take this bolt after driving. You can drive this car 10 different times, take this on and off 10 different times, 10 different drives, and as long as you assemble it like this, you can remove this, and this bolt will always stay tight. If you flip this around, 
and have the threads this way, like this, you drive it one time. Take this off, put the bolt like this, it'll now be loose. Don't do that, please install it like this. You're gonna see this big washer. Now, on these kits, this is how you want it. Heinz like this. The reason I do this, it gets skinny in there. It allows room for this articulate. The number one cause, or yeah, number one cause, when people say, man, my outside hind joints wore out. I'm like, why? They never wear out. It's because people are installing these things. Oops, sorry. People are installing these things like this. Oh, sorry. Like that. And you can see it limits. You are now binding. This is not how it's supposed to be. Please do not do this. This is so annoying, so irritating, but I understand if you're uh, not familiar, finally, I am here to help you for everyone to see so you can save your product and not waste any more money. So again, this supplies a good shoulder against the spindle on one side, and the bolt supplies a great shoulder on the other side. This is as stable as you can get. You have zero issues for a very, very long time to come. Heim goes on. I also have a little bit of this shoulder supporting. As you can see, I don't want threads on my Heim. So we, we plan this out to get a good shoulder so your Heim is very secure on there. This is simply just a spacer to let it articulate and it still gives you enough room to fine tune your bump steer if you want before your nut runs out. And when you order your kit, I already pre-plan your K-member, I pre-plan your year, and I pre-plan your correct spindle. Um, I do give you the correct bump steer set up for your car when you order. There's two different versions, I already pre-plan it, and if you wanna fine tune it again, we do leave the room, but most of the time, this is gonna be a one inch spacer, and this is gonna be a quarter inch spacer in your kit. Save these for this. This is your shortest bolt out of all six, and this is how you're gonna set it up on both sides. So you can do this one hand, because when I first started this, I was all over the place. After some time, I figured out the easiest thing to do. This guy isn't going to super uh, slam his car, so we're gonna use the lower hole. Now the other good thing are Maximum Motorsports K-members, unlike others, each one of these mounting holes, you have dual mounting holes for your control arm. Both of these holes are raised one inch. You're like, what's that for? Anybody has a Mustang or knows anything about a Mustang knows that they have a really bad control arm arc. And most of the time, we all lower our Mustang. They pretty much already come flat at a high rate. So you lower it an inch, starts going like this. A little bit more, goes like this. Most drifters slam their cars, so it's like this. And the more it goes up, the worse your bump steer is gonna get. And there was a reason the first three things that ever came out on any of these cars was the aftermarket clutch cable and quadrant and firewall adjuster. They have something that needed to be fixed here from the factory. The other thing, if anyone was familiar with, was camber caster plates, because they had no caster, and caster is huge on these cars. So uh, a caster alone, if I mentioned it before, made these cars drive night and day different. And then there was bump steer kits, which probably sold more than anything besides camber caster plates, because these things had horrible bump steer right from the factory. So Maximum knew this, other companies that knew this, that made it, um, raised these up, because if you look at my arm, this is a normal kind of lowered ride height, but if you can raise this up in the K-member, you can start to see where this flattens out. Um, and if you're super low, you get to go a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, or in this case, he's not going super low. He said, I'm not going hot boy or whatever that may mean. He's at a respectable ride height where all the suspension can work and you're not having to super adjust stuff with super fancy stuff. Keep it simple, have fun. It's not gonna be slammed like some of these guys' cars, but this does have the capabilities if you wanna do it. The middle one goes back here. The very longest one goes up here. Now I'm gonna go ahead and install these bolts because this is how I install it, single-handedly, one person without dropping, without fumbling stuff. And you're gonna put this one through first. No washers needed at the moment, just a bolt to let it hang. Look at that, no problems. Then you're gonna set up this back one, same way. 
Now, if you want to be careful, slip a nut on this back one. We just don't want it falling out because we're going to be dealing with this one. And if you don't put that nut on and this falls out, boom, there goes your nice controller. It's going to be up to you to figure out what's correct for your car. Um, but for maximum, you know, or this setup, this is what I found. Now, you don't need any washer up here. I normally only put a washer on the nut side of what you're going to be spinning on. Um, now, in this case, it took this washer. Oh, that's something else, too. There's always a, a face side on a washer. And basically, this is like a bunch of stamped steel or flat steel. And it's made like a pizza cutter. Boop. The top side is going to be precise. side. It's a finished side. Sometimes there's writing on it. But it has like smooth edges. It's very easy to work around. And then you have a machine side. Now, on these washers, they were a little tight. Oop. So I had to machine them a little bit. But this side is going to be in there. Now, whatever you put in the front of the Heim, in your front control arm mounting bolt, needs to also match the exact same distance in the back. And the reason for that, we are mounting the front Heim dead center in the middle. And I do that, again, as the default install. So when you get it there, I already know what your rack spacing is perfectly supposed to be, and we'll get into that later when we install the rack. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and slip this together. See, it's hanging, hands-free. I slip this up. Now I can slip this bolt through. I can let it be. Now I can grab the other side. Exact same setup. There it is. Again, skinny side towards hind, big size towards support mounting piece. So now I can simply back my bolt off enough to slip this in there. Oops, turn it around. Now it's in. Now I can take my washer. Now you're going to pull this bolt back through again, just enough to give you that space. You can kind of hold the leverage with the bolt as a, as a, as a handle, so to speak. You slip in your washer. It's a little snug as it should be. You want this as snug as possible. See, it's not falling out. That's what you want. If you got to tap it in a little bit, please do. Now, in the stock K members, you have the ability. These things are so wishy-washy. If it's a huge gap or no gap, you can take like a dead blow and kind of tap it. And, and, uh, and when you tighten them back up, it'll close up the gap. But again, what I showed you, when this is all tight, you want to be able this to drop. So if you are in there playing and with the gaps or whatever, whatever you need to do, just make sure that this swings easily. If it's not swinging easily, it means that these himes are bound inward or bound outward and are binding, and your himes will go out incredibly fast. And that's why our bushings and spacers are fully adjustable like this. So no matter what K-member you got, you have the adjustment. There you go. No play. Bushings nice and solid. Now at this point, when you get the front ones together, you can basically slip your washer. There's always a face and a backside to a washer. I always like using the washer side. I'm particular about it. Uh, you need some kind of washer to uh, run a, you know, something between your nuts that's gonna spin because you don't wanna keep on grinding your nuts or bolts into the K-member and wearing it out prematurely. So try to use washers when you can. Uh, I'm not too worried about the head of the bolt because you're not supposed to really turn the head of the bolt. You have this entire shaft in there that's tight that could be against stuff. And if you try to break it loose from the bolt this side, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to add a little bit more pressure. The nut side is always the side you wanna spin off and that's why we supply the washer on the nut side. And once you get them hand tight and you get, basically get everything all assembled, well, honestly, you can just go in and torque this one done. Once you get these hinds, uh, centered and all this stuff in, you can forget about this front hind and just torque it down. And now you can focus on the back. That fit perfect on this side. And I'm gonna show you how good these maximums are. I haven't even tested it on this side. I already assembled the other side. And when I assembled the other side, I just counted the exact same washers and spacers and did a mirror image on this side. This will be the first time I'm actually sticking this on. Now, because again, how both these pieces are held up, I can bring this arm out, kind of support it, pull this bolt out, let it hang, and now I can put on my washers and spacers, and in this case, I did need, might as well show you, a little shim that's skinnier than the rest of the washers, but that's what I needed to get it exact. 
Um, if you play with these washers and spacers, you should be able to find 100% correct formula uh, that fits good for your K-member on your car. If for some reason um, they're not, you can contact my buddy Steve Mass. He's the guy that supplies all these washers and spacers. And, but there's nothing really special about these. You can get them at Ace Hardware, any local store. And if you go to a fancy store, you can actually find these washers that come in different sizes. Uh, but you wanna get them in there as tight as possible. And I'm not talking like, oh, we're gonna bind this together and close up gaps by tightening the bolt. You wanna get this as tight as possible on both sides of the hime to the K-member, front and back, before you even start to tighten it. No gaps. If you have a gap, and you try to close it up, it's either gonna push or pull the arm forward or rearward, and you try not to do that. So I'm just going ahead and throw these in. Here goes my spacer, and I can almost guarantee you this should go. I didn't even put any spacers in the back yet, and you can see there's no gap. This is how good maximum is. I, I didn't even touch this side. That's what I had on the other side. I come here, it's exactly the same. This is how good quality. My buddy Steve Mass makes the arms. His jig is uh, ultimately very nice. Where we actually crashed an arm, bent an arm in a crash, and we had a spare arm, and we didn't move any adjustments or anything. We just simply put on his arm, and then we hurried up and checked the alignment. He was a 16th different on this tire in tow. Camber caster was exactly the same and toe only changed the 16th. That could have been a difference in a bolt tighten. I mean, who knows? But I really like the quality control on Steve's arms, and I've always loved the quality control in Maximum Motorsports. Anyways, now that we got this part right, again, how easy is this? One-handed, move the bolt back, and now we're moving on to the back part, which, again, I've already calculated. Again, small side of the heim, or the spacer, in towards the heim. And when I get it matched up there, I can push the bolt through enough to hold it in place. And now I'm getting these washers. And again, I'm gonna expect this to be exactly the same. I got the, this is gonna, a three quarter spacer in the back of the hind. Just doesn't have to be that specific, depending on what you do, it's just what worked for ours. And I had three washers on the back of the spacer, on the K-member on the passenger side. So I got three washers on this side and hopefully they line up a little snug, but they're lining up. Now, sometimes there's inconsistencies in washers, uh, stuff like that. I have uh, ground or sand because sometimes the punch or there'll be just a little minor imperfections in the washer. You can get some flat sandpaper if that's the case, sand down the edges. If you see like a little nick, you know, go over them. And uh, I did have to do that with one of these and then it fit. There we go. Now I'm gonna go ahead and tighten this up and torque it and then we can do the arm test. Assemble the arm by itself, but it is a little bit helpful when you're torquing it because I put this at 130 pounds. Torque specs for some reason stay in between 110 and 150. Uh, it's kind of weird at a big window like that. I chose 135 and you really have to crank down on these and it's kind of hard to hold two wrenches at the same time. So me and my buddy uh, handled it. Uh, we did both sides. We already tested the other side. We just want to show you on one side. This is what you want. That's 130 pound torque here, 135 here and here. No spindle, not much weight, but the arm should swing like that. If it's like this, Double check your spacing here. I don't care, it's in there. That's where it is. It should be like this. If it moves like this, that's all right. This is just a little fast because it's really close. But as long as it can articulate, it ain't bound up. And I don't mean like it can, like you shouldn't have to push this. It should fall freely, simple like that or really close to it. That shows me that this is perfect and we're good to move on. So now that we got the arm installed, the next thing that we do is to mount this gorgeous custom reinforced bump steering bump stop drill oh, stock Ford metal <laughs> spindle, modified spindle by Mr. Duncan. So this is the next thing we're gonna put on. Pretty straightforward. Oh, the other thing we do to help correct uh, or simulate a drop spindle for the lowered Mustangs 
Now, obviously the Maxilum K member we were talking about has raised, uh, uh, raised mounting points. We also use a Stita times two ball joint. It's extra long and it, it basically spaces uh, the distance where the control arm mounts to the spindle. And it simulates, you know, uh, like a drop spindle without actually having to have a drop spindle. Um, and and I, I don't know, I'm not super into slam cars. If you want your car super slammed, I highly recommend the Maximum Motorsports or my partner Steve Mass has a stage five spindle and it is a custom drop spindle. Uh, his car is super slammed. If you ever look it up, look it up. His uh, Instagram is flags and wheels and it's a badass car. You can't miss it. And he has a spindle that uh, uh, can correct uh, the, uh, the geometry here if your car is super slammed. So the next thing I'm gonna do is just run this nut on and go ahead and tighten it and uh, torque it on. Now sometimes when you come in and tighten these, the ball joint might spin and you're like, man, what the hell? So sometimes you gotta add a little pressure in here because the swedge will now get a tight fit. Um, and it could be as simple as putting a jack underneath here and pushing down on the spindle as your gun is there. In this case, uh, I don't think it's gonna happen, so I'm just gonna go ahead and run my gun on it. Oops, come on. Now that I got it ran down, I can set up my little thing to torque. I'm gonna follow the torque specs on this and then we can move on to the next spot. But now that we got the ball joint torqued, uh, really quick, I just wanted to show you something. Uh, I have the steering stop Allen button head screwed all the way in. And that's so it doesn't interfere as we're checking anything or whatever, just run it all the way in. It's not where it's gonna stay, but at the moment, run it in. Now, don't skip this part of adjusting this in the, in, in the end. This is uh, a key piece to make stuff, uh, make sure your stuff lasts a long time. Now, I have this welded on plate to be able to hit this, but you're also gonna notice on my stage three and four spindles, I have a, uh, also an Allen button head here. As you can tell, it's nice and smooth. There's no hard edges. And I put these on here in case the customer ever wants to run a stock ball joint. It gives the customer a little bit of his chance because the Steeda ball joints are expensive. I think they're totally worth it uh, considering what an aftermarket uh, drop spindle may cost. Um, you know, it just gives the customer a choice. Maybe he doesn't want to lower his car and he doesn't need that. And he can run a, a, a stock size, uh, you know, ball joint. But if you notice where this sits, it sits below this bolt. Our bump stop sits below the bolt. Now, if we run a shorter uh, ball joint, it's going to lower this as well. And I ran this round button head against this round button head. So in case it ever makes contact, it's consistent. There's no sharp edges to get stuck, wear each other out. It's just like a smooth contact against a smooth contact. So if you're ever transitioning uh, down the track, um, it, it's, it's going to be consistent every time. You don't want any sharp edges where anything can here can hang up. Another great piece by another great company. And also, uh, love this guy, Odie, the owner, driver, builder, designer, who got this company. It's a really down to earth person, down to earth person, and uh, not a lot of people give uh, little guys a chance by the time they get to that uh, point in their life. And he was very humble and gave me a chance. And uh, I love what they have. It's it's, a, it's some of the best stuff I've ever come across. They're willing to make their parts to interchange with other parts. And not many companies are willing to work with other companies or make something when feel can very well make their own camera caster plates. Uh, but they do understand how big of an impact and uh, it's kind of hard to deny how good Maximum Motorsport parts are. The, uh, the advantage is, I mean, we actually just have true coilovers and they've seen a, a decent thing and were willing to work with me because I didn't want to get away from the Maximum camera caster plates and they let me sacrifice their owns for these and they also went through and made all the bushings in order to make it work. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Now, our these stock camber caster plates or maximum camber caster plates, they're gonna give you these four spacers. You're gonna have four spacers left over out of your tool hardware on each side. You're gonna have two big ones and two small ones. Now, you're gonna take these two small ones and not use them. You don't use those. You're only gonna use these two big ones. Now, please don't mess this up. The two big ones 
going right on top of the fields, just like that. And that's gonna space your spring. The other good thing about these fields is there was a lot of clearance problems where the coilovers would go up and hit stuff like the bottom of these bolts or whatever. And they were able to make, these, make this design to put the spring down to give me as much room as possible so you don't have to do that much work in there. There's some work, but believe me, there was more. If you don't run these coilovers, the bottom heads of these bolts underneath, the head of the bolts, if you put your head underneath here and look up, you actually have to grind some of those heads of the bolts so they don't hit other brand coilovers. Um, and we, we made it work, but it, it's a lot of finicky. It's, it's a hit or miss. You really gotta take a good look. You don't have to worry about the feels. What I've shown you, they go right in, clears everything, it's great. I got the two spacers on. I'm gonna carefully stick them on in. It shows a little bit of threads. Just like that, done. There's no wash or anything right there. When you zip this up, it tightens it up. Now, if I remember right, this is 25 uh, foot pounds. It's not a lot, this is a hollow thing. Please do not put an impact gun and just cram this down. These coilovers are adjustable. They come with these little knobs, we're gonna show them on there. I believe these things are 30 way adjustable. These things work great right in the middle. They're phenomenal. Odie really did his research on the balancing, the valving, and he sends them to you in the middle. If they do get moved, uh, you know, count all your clicks and cut it in half and go there. As in, if you got 30 adjustments, you're gonna go all the way to one side, you know, click, click, click until it locks out and then come back 15, and you're gonna be in the middle. And I suggest if you're like wanting to adjust with it, don't go more than two clicks at a time because there's a huge difference in these. And in all the times that we've used these, um, we've never been past four clicks. Uh, it's amazing. If you feel like you're starting to understeer, it's too stiff, soften them up a click or two until it starts to grab. If you feel like it's a little too grabby, too washy, just tighten them up. Uh, you know, and just a couple clicks at a time make a huge difference in these. Um, and if you are playing around and be like, ah, oh, you know, and you get lost and not sure where you are, again, go all the way, come back 15, you're gonna start in the middle, and it kind of puts you back where you started from so you can kind of like regain your feet and, and go from there. Now, aren't these coilovers, they come fully compressed uh, to make room in the boxes. And uh, it can kind of uh, frustrate people. How do I adjust them? What do I do? If you look on the bottom of here, it's literally flush. The inside cartridge has this outside sleeve. And what I found as a good starting point is you're gonna stick your tape measure in there like this. See how it's not even an inch? I would say start at two and a half inches uh, on your Mustangs. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not super low, it's not, su it's not high, but it's basically almost like an inch and a half, almost a two inch drop. And it's just a good starting point. Um, it's it's uh, not like this in the back. I'll show you how to do the backs, but for the fronts, just match them out. You can kind of see we're getting there. It's about two and a half right there. So I'm just gonna hold that in place. Spin this down and lock it. I already did the other side. And that's another, like I said, another good starting point. Uh, please look on Phil's website and look at all their install, adjusting, droop height, I mean, everything that they got and really do the research and set it up to your car, like spend the time. You, you, you spent good money on a good part and you might as well get the best of what you got. You know, don't assume, oh, they're ready. There is like a little generic thing they put you to get you close, but you can really kind of like fine tunings if you want. And anyways, I'm at two and a half uh, inches. I got this locked down kind of by hand just so it doesn't uh, turn. You can see. Now we are ready to install the spindle to the strut. Actually, I forgot something. Um, I forgot to say and actually do this until I just realized there's in this angle kit, there is a, uh, an Ackerman built into the spindle that if it turns too much, the spindle will actually flop to the side and it will start to wear out the, uh, the side tire. It's, it's almost like too much uh, caster. When you're driving, you can never feel too much self steer, but you can actually roll over on the side of the tire and you'll notice because you'll be scrubbing your sidewall. And that was something we noticed in our earlier years, but this is the trick that I found to fix that. And it's very simple. You can get a step drill, make sure the teeth, the little cut, 
is slightly wider than this, and you're gonna drill. Now these do come with a little bit of adjustment, but it's not enough to my liking. And in our stage three kit, I only advise you to drill the bottom. Because if you drill both, you get excessive play and it's a little bit too much. Uh, the stage three has a certain amount of angle and you only need to correct this a little bit. Our stage four, our stage five is a whole lot more angle, not a whole lot, but considerably a lot more. And you should drill both. And you're gonna drill the bottom to three quarter. If you have the four or five kit, you're also gonna drill the top to also a three quarter. This is what I'm using. It, it clearly says three quarters, so I know I can't do too much. Let me get my glasses on. Let me double check, see how far I got. And there goes our other three quarter hole. I'm really a stickler about how they put the bolts in this thing. Um, we are ready now to uh, attach the spindle to the strut and we're literally closing up this, clit, this kit as uh, closer we get. When I said a stickler, how Ford put stuff, they put this bolt in the back, headed forward. And they did it for a number of reasons. Uh, well, actually, may, I don't know why they did it, but for me, it's something I'm familiar with and it's really easy for the my tools, it's repeatable. Uh, you don't wanna do it, then I don't know. I just, I just like my bolts like that. Calipers here, I mean, it's easy to get to, a 24 socket in the front. I, I just like keeping Ford's bolts how they had them. Just not trying to re-engineer the engineer's idea and it's something I'm familiar with, so it's like just goes back and forth like pie. You can see the adjustment we now have. What we're gonna to wanna to do before we tighten this is get this locked in this position. You can either put your knee, you can put a pipe, you can have a friend go like this, but somehow you wanna keep this tension like this before we tighten these two bolts up. That pretty much sums it up for the most hardest things in this kit. After that, it's really just installing the rack uh, his rack, we're gonna have some adjustable uh, rack bushings and we can kind of dial it in here. And then it comes with a Steve Mass Bumpster kit that he made to match with his arms. And however long he lengthened the arms, he made his bumps here. We already had this locked down and done. Again, this is how the bolt goes. Big spacer, tapered down, shoulder hitting the spindle. This goes right on like this. Spacer, taper up, support down, just like this. And then you can just kind of loosely set this up like that. Just remember, that's a configuration. I'm not gonna go ahead and zip this down uh, because I'll be fighting trying to turn this on when I install the rack. So I'm just putting this on there just so I don't lose the parts, kind of get it out of the way, kind of simulates what you're dealing with. And that's what we're dealing with. Kind of gives you an idea of what you're, what, what, you know, what's going on. So before we put the rack in or start, you know, trying to place it up, this is my rack spacer kit. Um, these size bushings are specific depending on your setup. When you call me and uh, order them or order them on my website, duncanperformance.com, I kind of think about what your car setup is. There's some questions on the site that you got to answer, and there is two different versions of this. If you decide to play with your own rack positioning. Um, or arm positioning, I strongly suggest you do some research and figure out what size or how to modify, shorten, uh, or lengthen these to follow and match where you mount the arms at. Like I said, you set it all up like this, I don't care. Uh, I was driving my car every weekend, I was driving my car every, uh, every Wednesday at our local track, and I had this set up for years. I mean, the only way any of this, it, down to an inner, a, a stock AutoZone or cheap O'Reilly inner tie rod, uh, they would last for years unless you came up and hit someone. And that's how important your rack positioning is. Uh, and when I get this mounted, I'll show you, but right now we need to put these in. And on this Maximum K member, it kind of made things a little easier because if you don't have one and you try to install their solid rack bushings, this is your stock inner sleeve that's press fit inside your uh, K member your stock came member And it's kind of a pain in the butt. It's swedge fit in there. Uh, this one was so frozen to the rack, it actually came out with the rack. But what you're gonna wanna do is 
put this all the way in your cane member, whatever's sticking out, you have to cut flush and kind of make a decent cut. And uh, you know, it's just pain in the butt, uh, but it's what you got to do with the rack and you know, putting these solid bushings in. But we don't have to talk about that because we have a maximum cane member makes life a little easier. So unless you got some weird um, oil pan that won't allow you to put these from the back forward, which some of these big bulky oil pans do, you'll actually have to go front to rear. And I particularly don't like that because I'd rather hang these off a stud. It's a lot more easier to put on instead of having everything go like this and you're blindly trying to find the hole. So in this case, he has a stock pan. There's plenty of clearance. Bolts come through. These bolts are longer uh, than the stock one because sometimes with spacers and bushings and rack spacers, uh, you know, whatever, you'll actually start running out of threads on the stock bolt. These are hardened bolts that are just as strong as stock. They're just a tad bit longer to make up for the bushing. Now, there goes the bushings. And now we're a little more closer to putting on the rack and pinion. Now, the first bushing that's gonna go on, or, you know, solid bushing are gonna be these. Now, if you look really careful, they're cupped on one side and flat on the other. The reason this is cupped is because it meets, meets the opposing part that matches with it and you can see how it rotates and can wobble. And the reason for that, if there's any imperfections of the rack meeting to the K member, and it's not perfect, and you go ahead and tighten this up, it can put a twist on your uh, rack and pinion and break your rack and pinion. Now, in all honesty, it's never something that I've come across, but it is something I've heard about and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna argue or try to make my own engineering with uh, Maximum or whoever else that's ran into this because obviously they're, they're the ultimate professionals that, I mean, they said it, I gotta, I gotta go with it. Uh, just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Have an open mind, don't try to over engineer a better engineer than yourself. So again, this is how it's gonna go on. The flat side, is gonna go up against my bushing and it rides smooth. Now, if you look, this hole is off center. And if you read through the instructions, it gives you a lot of adjustment up and down. Um, you know, it kind of favors one side. It can go really, really small this side, not so much that side. Or if you flip them up, it can go really high, you know, and not so much down. And you flip it down, it can get really low. Uh, on this car, they fix a lot of geometry on here. But because of the raised control arm mounting points on the K member, um, different ball joints, different bump steer setups, uh, they really made this as universal as possible. And in, sometimes it can be confusing to the person, but because I have these on the lower, it's only an inch off from stock. Uh, the bump steer stuff has kind of all been compensated. This is a setup I've done a bunch. I try to put it close in the middle and it lines up pretty much where I like it a lot. Now I'm gonna put it just like this on flat side to the thing and curved on the outside to the rack. And it'll pretty much just sit just like that. This side as well, curved out, flat this side. And just so you know, the front of the car is this way, this way. That's the back of the car, in case you don't know. Now that we got that part, we're gonna come over here to the rack and pinion. Now, this rack and pinion is kind of gross. It was corroded. We've tried to get another one. It's actually got a bad, tie rod in here, um, but we can't seem to get one uh, anytime soon. So I'm gonna get back home. I'm gonna send him a new rack. Uh, this guide he's seeing, he's gonna install it and uh, we'll move forward. But right now we kinda gotta deal with this. Now, if we get a brand new rack and all this stuff is clean, I have run into a problem where when you're inserting these things, sometimes they're loose and spin and can fall out. So if that's the case, clock these how you want. And make sure that these go straight up and down in the rack. If they're cockeyed sideways or something, it won't line up. Make sure these are straight up and down as possible. And if it's loose, put a little bit of silicone in there, press it in, you know, as far in as it'll go, and let it sit for about 20 minutes. Hopefully your silicone dries, and now this won't move and fall out. Because these type of bushings with all these adjustments and this and that, if anything's loose, it's really a pain in the butt to put on. So the more stable you can get these to stuck on your rack or the car, the easier this job goes. Now, because this is like this and a lot of stuff, 
when you're getting this rack on there and before you zip it down, really take a good close look at these bushings. That everything's kind of where you want it to be because it's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a little tricky technical spot right here. So just really take a good close look. On this rack, I'm gonna take advantage of a little bit of this dirt because ain't nothing really that loose. So I'm gonna press it in just like this. It'll, it'll stay in tight. Now you can see how I, hmm, need it. No, no, that's all right. So however I got this, you can kind of tell the circle is not, the circles are not centered in, in, in the major circle. It kind of favors one side. So take a good close at that. It's very easy to miss. However you set this side up, make sure you match it to same as here. You don't want your rack teeter-tottering from side to side because you don't have the hole center. So I know how that one is. I'm gonna come over here and do the exact same thing. Line it up. You wanna hand me the rubber uh, Mau Mau? Beautiful black, please don't use a hammer. Very easy to go in. Done. Done. On the back side, I also hope this is the same. Again, notice how it's favoring one side or the other. So however this sits on this side, you have to do a mirror image on the other side. Now you also notice this concave. Remember that's to this. And if one of the silliest things that I've noticed when people install this is sometimes they put the flat side against this curved side and then tighten it up and it actually smashes and deforms this thing. So this is something that I notice a good number, a good number amount of people seem to mess up. So really make sure you see, you know, the rounded edge to that. And now we're gonna see how these things fit in, or I'm gonna take a good look at here, make sure I got the, you know, the, the favoring uh, lower, upper, same as the back. Hopefully this is a tight fit. It's, uh, yeah, it's actually in there and it's kind of snug. So we got kind of lucky. Don't worry about the steering shaft right now. This is so far out that the steering shaft isn't gonna interfere with this. And I had kind of had to push the steering shaft in to release it off the rack and pinion earlier in the job. So right now it is collapsed a little bit into the car, knowing it's gonna give me more room. And because this rack is gonna be installed a little bit forward, I'll have a plenty of room to put the uh, steering rack onto, uh, I'm sorry, the column onto the rack. And I don't have to worry about that until this is installed. Normally kind of got to jiggle with that and match it. Not this time, it goes right together. And we're gonna put this in the middle hole. And again, there's a bunch of loose parts. Got my buddy over there pushing back on the back of the studs. I got my fingers clamping them so they don't turn. There we go. Look at that. Now, these things did kind of fall. So again, like I was saying, you want to double check to make sure how they sit. Uh, it's pushed on. I like the clocking of it. I like the space, everything. I double checked it all. Now these are the original nuts off your original rack and pinion mounting bolts. These washers come with the kit. I simply put these on to keep the aluminum from getting mauled. And these same nuts work on my bolts. And we're simply just gonna tighten those on, torque those to specs, and we can kind of forget about this and move on. It's done, torqued, done. Now you would think we'd come up here and just start putting our inner tie rods and put these on uh, to kind of help you on an alignment so you're not like steered all the way to the right or to the left. You kind of want to get a tape measure and choose uh, the same left and right little distance right here. Like, you know, if this side is two inches or an inch and three quarter, make sure that's the same. You got your adjusting nut and you would basically just screw this on, you know, the same. Well, let's, let's see what this is first and we'll actually set it. But the reason I'm not hooking it up to the spindle because I need a centered rack. Remember we took off that uh, steering shaft off the rack and pinion? Well, not only do we have to figure out to get a steering wheel straight, we also have to make sure that his rack is centered in the middle. 
The rack could be a turn to the left, turn to the right, and then your, you know, if your steering wheel's off a little bit. Now, on this particular car, the steering shaft can only go one way on the rack, and it's kind of hard to mess up. If you had an airbag or something and the pieces are still in there, and if you're turned a bunch and you turn a little extra, you can break your airbag. Um, on a drift car, I'm not sure what you got an airbag for, so hopefully you get rid of it or disconnect it. But you can't like really mess up the steering with this. I just try to get it centered just to double check everything. I love a stock steering wheel because it's dummy proof. You can't put it on wrong except up or down or you know upside down or, or whatever. So all you gotta do is put the shaft right onto the, uh, to the rack and pinion. And if you just never took the steering wheel off, the, the steering shaft only goes on one way correct on the, on the rack and pinion. The problem in this case is he has an aftermarket steering wheel. And I almost think every steering wheel I've ever ran into that was aftermarket that took some adapter, for some reason it never lined up perfectly like the stock uh, steering wheel does. And in this kit, uh, I'm using every inch of steering possible. Or in stock cars, it could be off, like a, you know, a aftermarket wheel, if it's off, oh, you could adjust it in your toe, you know, kind of favor the rack side to side to, to center it with your wheel. I'm using every inch of travel in the rack and pinion, and there is no, oh, we can go a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, no, it has to be perfectly centered. And the steering wheel, if you want it to look correct and up and down it has to be perfectly center but if you have to have often uh, if you have an aftermarket uh steering wheel and it's off there's no correction there's nothing you can do in this you can only put it together one way and this the steering wheel is kind of off 95 percent i said that's why i like a stock wheel anyways moving on from that i'm going to show you real quick how to find center from your steering wheel what you want to be straight up and down and to find center in the rack. That's gonna be the next thing that we do. And when we finish that, if it's okay, we can go ahead and move this up. If not, there is alternatives to that. Um, and this is also something that you have to know, I feel you wanna know, cause like I said, I'm really important about the wheel looking right. Unless you got one of those universal ones and you just put some tape around it, be like that center and you just make it up as you go. But he has a really nice steering wheel in here. It does have an up and down. And the only way to other adjust that uh, again, Maxim Motorsports uh, steering shaft. It's, it can go on multiple grooves. So no matter how far it's off, you can correct it. In this case, we can't, so we gotta double check it. Okay, so right now I do not have the outer tie rods hooked up and they are hanging. And the reason for that is I don't want any interference from my steering rack to my steering wheel. I wanna see full travel side to side. Really nice sparkle. What's really nice about this, it already gives me a clocking position. So I'm just gonna imagine 12 o'clock, and if this is perfect, I should have one and a half turns that way, maybe one and three quarter, maybe one and a quarter, I'm not too sure what this rack is, but let's just make up, I got one and a half turns that way, and if this is centered, I should have the exact same one and a half that way. Now, for some reason, if I have one and three quarter that way, and one and a quarter that way, that means pretty much I have half a turn too much that way, and I, and I need to start figuring this out. But let's just hope, uh, like I said, sometimes the uh, aftermarket steering wheels don't work. So we're at 12, we're gonna see what happens. We got one, one and one o'clock. Kinda makes me nervous. So we're gonna come back. That was center. Let's see what it does this way. One, one and that. And it's not, it's not centered. And like I said, almost every uh, aftermarket steering wheel is not the same. And you're gonna be like, well, it's not much. That much difference right there could be five to 10 degrees in the kit. And if you want it to line up like this, I'm gonna make this number up. Uh, since we didn't have that much that way, I'm gonna make it up. I only have 60 degrees of that angle that way, but because I have a quarter turn this way, I might have 65 degrees this way. And I really want the exact same so I can, I can kick out the car and at the same angle, right or left. And unfortunately, this wheel is not centered and there's no way to really fix this because this only goes on one way. Now you do have these six bolts and I'm gonna try 
to kick it over and see what happens, but I kind of doubt it, but we're gonna try it. So we uh, tried to click it over uh, one teeth, uh, you know, out of these six bolts, I went one position over, and how I was at one o'clock at nine o'clock, it simply just put it at three o'clock and at 11 o'clock. It was the exact same off position, but now to the other side. So I was thinking maybe I went two bolts over. So this, I was very carefully, moved it back one, it went right back to our original position. On a stock column uh, steering shaft where it meets the rack and pinion, there is no adjustment. There's like one flat side uh, on the rack to meet the, uh, the steering shaft, it's it, that's all you got. Um, and that's why I like to stock wheel so much because when it's straight, it lines up perfectly with the rack. It will be one side, it will be three o'clock, all the way this side will be six o'clock and it's centered. I never have no problem with it. So Fox bodies are notorious for having terrible rear suspensions. And so in part to keep this suspension stable, uh, we got this Maximum Motorsports Pan Hard Bar. Uh, we're just gonna stick this up uh, just to give me a little bit more rigidity and for when the car gets into snap oversteer, uh, it just kind of keeps everything centered so that the rear end isn't slopping back and forth. So we're going to put this in uh, and then we'll finish the install. Uh, so right now we're installing coilovers and a pan hard bar on a Bruce uh, Mustang. Um, we already got the pan hard bar cleaned up. My buddy did all the gracious work. Uh, I just welded it. He painted it. Uh, it's installed, it's done. Now we need to worry about a little bit of modifications for putting the coilovers on. And these are stock lower shock mounts. And there's a lot of controversy about, oh man, they break when you put coilovers on them, uh, blah, 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 blah. And I'm gonna call that a myth buster because these things are incredibly strong and the only handful of ones I've ever seen break is because the car was rusted, all of this was rusted, and the bolt in there was incredibly, uh, incredibly, like just fatigued by rust. And it was, that, that's where it actually broke, is the bolt. And it's, it's actually a bigger, stronger bolt, I believe, than the aftermarket stuff you can get. Now, don't get me wrong, Maximum sells a wonderful piece there. And if you do have a pan hard bar like he has, it's a really nice custom piece uh, on this side that does hold your coil over. Um, so, I mean, if you were really doing it up, man, sure it had, you know, get the piece over here to match it. But do you have to do it because this piece is gonna break? Absolutely not. And the only clearance problem you kinda might have, which, well, you don't. The coilover uh, from Peel doesn't hit anything. But when you have these stock control arms on this car like he has, there's a lot of uh, rear end articulation where the pinion angle's jumping around. There's a huge bushing in the stock control arms up front. You just wanna get rid of it. but. Um, he's going to, but just to make sure he doesn't have any problems anymore or anyone else that does put these coilovers on their car using the stop bracket, you want to hit this in. He already hit it, but if you can imagine this comes straight up and this piece sticks out about this far. Now it doesn't hit the coilover naturally as you bolt it in, but if he was to drive it and it starts articulating, it can hit. So all you got to do is hit this in, it's two little swacks, and I don't care what happens, it's not going to hit. It's not gonna break, but do inspect it to make sure it's not rusted. That is the telltale sign if you need to replace it or not. Now, the other side of the van hard bar uh, basically replaces the stock shock mount that we showed earlier that you just had a little, take a little swack to make some clearance. And this is now your new attachment. It comes right over like this. There's an extra long bolt that goes through that now holds the control arm in place. Hold on one second, let me just line this up. And this is, yep, that just goes through. Now this is also going to be the new mount for the field coilovers. And the field coilover is going to sit right in this perch and it attaches right up top. And this right here controls or holds the adjusting bar that slides across for the panel bar. Right now, Brian's just just getting lined up. There you go. Nice. You got a washer on that one side of the bolt. Comes all the way through. Wow, this really went together really easy. Another one for maximum. Hitting it out the park. Yeah, tighten it up. There you go. Here goes all these. We're done with all these. Most of the pan hard bar. And now I can put the fuel coilovers in. Um, on the back of 79 to 04 Mustangs, uh, 
There is a little trimming in the back we need to do. And this is the only problem that I've had uh, semi-consistently. And there's some rumors and some myths I like to clear up. You need to trim the least amount possible in here to get this to fit. This is almost installed right now, but it hits in its top little corners. And this piece is just gonna go up a little bit extra. If you look right here, you can see my little silver outline. And I basically kind of eyeball where the shock hits on the bottom, and I'm finding the angle. I got this in the top hole, and I'm finding the angle, because that angle is gonna give me my straight line just barely outskirting where this goes. And just from doing a bunch of these, I know it's only about a half an inch to a quarter inch above the factory little cutout. You only go this high. And sometimes when people cut in there, they realize there's a whole pocket in there. And why do all this little trimming? Because, oh, I can just come up here and cut this whole thing out. See my white line? That's how big people cut this out. But what you don't notice is there's a tack weld there, there's a tack weld here, there's another one here, almost one there. One, two, whatever, 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 whatever. So they cut out the tack welds. You're like, what do those tack welds do? That is one of the most major supports that hold in your shock uh, little home in place in the car. So you just cut out its whole foundation and wonder why it's falling out of the car. People will say, oh, these cars can't take coilovers. Please do some research on your Mustangs before you speak such nonsense. They've been in these cars since the early 80s. Never had a problem here. Every other coilover uh, doesn't have to really do this that was out on the market. They have a lot lower spring uh, areas down here. They gave you a lot of room. Um, but we were trying to make room down here and this is the way we went and for a little trimming, whatever. Sometimes you don't even have to trim this. People will take a crescent wrench and kind of flare this out. But I don't like that because you get your tire in here and you, you get a big tire and it gets really close and you got some suspension travel or you jack it up and now these flaps may hit your nice rims or cut your tire. Now, if you only trim out this piece, you will not have to worry about this from 94 to 04, I guarantee you. It's only the Fox bodies that rip this out and I can show you about 20 pictures that they rip out on stock shocks. It's just a poorly welded to together car. I strongly recommend stitch welding these cars literally from shock to strut in the front of the car to the back of the car and your car will hold together. You won't have any problems. Um, other than that, that's it. Only trim out what's needed unless you want to go in there and weld up your entire little hole you, you butchered, basically. It does look clean if you cut it all out. I'm just not into doing a bunch of extra work if I don't need to. You can still see the big outline that a lot of people uh, say, oh, it ripped out. They don't take coilovers that they all cut out. Um, you can still see all the spot welds in place. And you can see my little original trim piece in just this little corner of how little, oh, actually, this went right there. You can see how little I needed to trim out around this. Jan, I want to thank you so much for coming here. You, yeah. you have no clue how much this has helped me out. I'm super excited about the kit. I'm super excited about getting out on the road. Uh, I hope that we can get this video complete and give everybody all the knowledge that they need. Everything that you've taught me is, it, it's, it's an abundance of stuff that you don't think about and that most people don't think about when you say, I'm just gonna go drifting. So I'm super excited about this. There's so much information and we're gonna pump this video out and get it out there for you. Um, anything else you wanna say uh, before, before you head back to the West Coast? You have no idea how much this video will help me because I've spent thousands, one guy alone, he knows who he is, spent 21 hours on an install. And that's, at that point, it, it kills me. So this will spend, I mean, will save me thousands of hours. I got to spend it some time to watch your install videos. They're some of the best ones I've ever watched. So when you guys see this, give these guys a follow. They're amazing, very professional, very, uh, show me Washington, D.C. Your hospitality was second to none. No problem. Uh, uh, Let's thank some people. So we definitely want to thank Field Suspension yeah. 
for the suspension we have, uh, Steve Mass for the control arms, obviously the spindles, Mr. Duncan himself here. Uh, we have Maximum Motorsports, K-Member, Panhard Bar. Uh, I'm gonna get a bunch of other items from Maximum Motorsports so that I can finish the rest of my setup. Uh, do you have anybody else you wanna thank here back home? Um, yeah, uh, Trent Muser helped me out a lot with uh, getting where I am now. He taught me a lot. He was a really good apprentice of mine. He learned a lot and he's like, I couldn't be more prouder of the guy. And he went ahead way far than I ever thought was possible and he came back and taught me a lot, which uh, changed my whole career to where now this is where I'm at and uh, it's amazing. Um, I wish we could have shown off some of the more steering. We ended up having a bad rack we didn't know we had and I am gonna come back and video chat and walk them all the <laughs> way through it and they're gonna finish that part of the video. But this is a huge thing to me. Um, it was great for everyone, I had a blast, man. Thank you very Excellent. much. Thank you, thank you. Um, Definitely can't wait to get this out on the get this out on the track. Jan, we're definitely gonna bring you back for the first ride out on the track. <laughs> That'd be cool. We have to bring you back so that you can experience the car along with us. Um, a great great day, great weekend. Um, we're gonna get the video done. Thank you everybody. Thanks for watching Not Another Car Vlog. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Absolutely. Take care.